Hello and welcome to The Cyber Den, your weekly dose of tech and games. I, Jake, will be chatting with Carl Benjamin. You may better know him as YouTube commentator and Gamergate supporter, Sargon of a Card. Thanks for coming, mate. Not a problem. Let us discuss the hashtag movement, Gamergate. After a year, the discussion is still going strong. Now, in your own words, please explain to those who do not know what Gamergate is all about. Gamergate is primarily a consumer revolution against a very corrupt and unethical press that effectively is the gaming media. Um, I don't think anyone is... Excuse me. I don't think anyone's in any doubt that the gaming press has been has long been corrupt. And this, the, the main problem with it is it it doesn't have any standards because it came out of an enthusiast press back from when gaming was you know back from when I was a kid and gaming was just it was a lot smaller it was a lot less mainstream and the press surrounding it was always a hobbyist press and it was always I guess I mean corrupt is maybe a strong word for it but it was always very much sort of um, you know, buy our games, and here's a game review alongside all of these adverts for the game that's being reviewed. And so you know that, you know, the people who are reviewing games have been given money by the people whose games they're reviewing. So it's it's always been... Uh, and I'm not even sure that the advertising revenue model will ever change. But recently, in recent years, there's been a distinct trend of indie developers who have noticed that there isn't any particular oversight to the press and the gaming industry. Uh, there's no like separate you know, press body or anything like that. And they've, frankly, beforehand, at least the AAA companies had the... At least they have the shame to not do everything that they do in public. Whereas these indie devs, they're, they're sort of like uh, the, the sort of next generation. And they've grown up with it being just kind of, kind of well-known, kind of obvious. And so everything that they do is on social media. <clears throat> Excuse me. So when, like when you see developers being supported by journalists who are friends with these developers and then talk in very positive, glowing terms in the, in the media about the games their friends are making. Like, for example, uh, Kotaku's Nathan Grayson with his buddy Robin on Art. And it's two in everyone's faces. And everyone's known it for such a long time. And so... When Gamergate began, everyone was like, look, this, there is just so much to talk about here because the gaming press has been... The standards of the gaming press have been so low for such a long time. Uh, so much advantage has been taken of that. But when it finally happened, I, I don't think that people knew just how deep the rot had really set until the censorship began. When people wanted to talk about this issue, almost... I, I can't think of an outlet that didn't censor it a big outlet that didn't censor discussion. And The Escapist, in fact, was the only one, I think. And even then, there was a great deal of pressure, and we, we only know that there was a great deal of pressure on Greg Tito, the then editor of The Escapist, because it turns out that all of the journalists were on a secret mailing list that obviously only the journalists know about, until it was leaked to um, Breitbart.com and then revealed. And so we got to see the editor-in-chief of Polygon emailing the editor-in-chief of The Escapist and demanding that they modify content on their site to suit Polygon's needs, which is very bizarre because, I mean, The Escapist is owned by Defy Media, whereas Polygon is a separate company, and theoretically they're in competition with each other. But um, they don't act like they're in competition with each other. They act as if they're all on the same team, as if they're part of a side. That's kind of the front that they presented to gamers. It's the journalists who are the gatekeepers to the developers, and then there's the plebs on the ground, uh, the plebs being talked down to. And that was very much the attitude, especially when, on the 28th of August 2014, they produced, I think it was about 12 articles, um, claiming that the very label of gamer is over. Nobody should use it anymore, and anyone who uses it is a rather bad person. And that was a particularly strange thing for the press to attack their own audience. And I think the combination of censorship and that is what really got most people into Gamergate who are in there. Now, Gamergate has been frequently, and unfairly, criticised by the press and are often described as sexist right-wingers. So, why do you think this is happening? Do you, do you think that they're trying to deliberately demonise Gamergate supporters, or, or maybe they're just misinformed, not putting enough effort oh, into... There's, there's no doubt that they're not misinformed. They know 
exactly what they're doing. I mean, just to take, for example, the just take what they say. I mean, to say that right winger, that that in their minds would be enough of a reason to dismiss Gamergate's concerns. That's a very bizarre thing to say. Oh, look, I disagree with his political position. Therefore, their concerns for, say, ethics or standards, or, you know, they, they don't want to be talked down to, they don't want to be insulted, they don't want to be hassled by their own press. That's, you know, but say, oh, no, they're right wing, so we don't have to listen to them. That's a very bizarre uh, position to adopt, I think. And it, I think it goes to show a lot to do with the mindset of these people. I mean, these are the people that, um, the Law and Order, S, uh, Special Victims Unit, ended up writing an episode based on this sort of narrative that uh, has been spun by the press. And it's, it's about identity politics. And if you don't really know what identity politics is, then I really envy you, because identity politics is one of the worst things you'll ever come across. But basically, to claim that there is a movement of... I, I think it's hard to get accurate numbers on Gamergate, but if you look at one of the main hubs, which is Reddit's Kotaku in Action... There are about 50,000 people there. And when I, when I put a Gamergate video up, it'll get about... Well, I mean, it'll get about 50,000 people in the first day watching it. And then I've got 160-something thousand subscribers. And so, you know, it ends up with about 70,000 views. So I imagine that some of them are people who are just interested in watching but aren't necessarily supporters. So I, I think 50,000 is probably an accurate number, or as accurate as we can do for the number of people who actively support Gamergate. And to say that 50,000 people from across the world got together to somehow just, I don't know, hassle women is, I, I think, a very... It's a tenuous thing to say. There's, I think I, I would, If someone told me this about anything else, I would find it hard to believe. So I don't see why I should believe it about gaming. And since I've been involved in Gamergate, I know that's not the case. So, you know, I, I just think... If someone, like, if someone told me that Black Lives Matter was about harassing black women or white women or something i'd say well is that likely <laughs> or is it uh is it more likely i can listen to them and you know they're claiming that you're being unethical how unethical is the gaming press not to mention uh two things i'd like to add um number one you mentioned of course about the law and order episode those who have not seen it i covered this in a previous episode of the cyberden but Oh, no, oh dear. It was so ridiculous and stereotypical. and It was rather amazing, wasn't it? Actually? Well, true, at the same time, it was such a farce. The, fact yeah, that yeah, the, whole, the whole premise of it was based on the idea that there was a group of gamers actually trying to get women out of gaming, and when they would, when they would spout the dialogue, it just felt so clunky and unrealistic. Just, it just sounded ridiculous, in yeah. my opinion. It, so it sounded like, if you compared it to, for example, say dialogue in the first Resident Evil game, then that would seem a lot more natural <laughs> compared to the dialogue in Law and Order. For, for example, forming yeah. a little terrorist group of gamers chasing out women from uh, game development. How ridiculous can you get? Yeah, I, I, it's not something that's really possible either. That's the thing. I mean, you know, no one's, no one's obligated to use social media. You can if you want, obviously, but no one, you don't have to use social media. And that's the that's where most of the alleged harassment is coming from, and I mean, how do you stop someone selling a game? How do you, you know, I I, I have no idea how that how that actually works. And one of the um, one of the things I like most about it is when the game is well, they they kidnapped a woman, and then they they were taunting the the city's police force, weren't they? And I was just like, what? You do you think they're going to die for video games? <laughs> But uh, yeah, it, <clears throat> just it's it's ridiculous. It's absolutely absurd. And to this date, not one woman has been chased out of gaming. And Gamergate's been going strong for over a year now. So we're not doing a very good job if we're a hate movement. But on the plus side, almost every website that we've uh, had an issue with has got a new ethics policy. So we're doing great on the ethics front. I'm pretty sure now, I've done a bit of research about Gamergate, and I'm pretty sure that uh, a large portion of the Gamergate supporters, even though the on the political scale, it is a bit scattered, mostly leaning towards the left, not the right. That's very true. Um, thousands of people in Gamergate uh, went to politicalcompass.org, I think it is, and went for a political compass test. And one of the, most people fell into the left-leaning libertarian uh, quadrant, bottom-left quadrant, which is socially aware but individualistic. Um, a, lot, a, fair, a fair amount, but probably about maybe a third of those people 
fell into the sort of right-leaning uh, libertarian quadrant, and virtually none of them fell into the authoritarian top quadrant, uh, qu two quadrants of right or left. Um, it very much politically seems to be a case that it's people who think that individualism and individual autonomy are much more important than collective collectivism and sort of authoritarianism. Let's talk about spreading the word of Gamergate. Plenty of people have spread the word about it by various formats, uh, documentaries, videos, articles, etc. What, what do you think have been the most successful uh, formats in getting the word across? You know, I, I actually just think uh, conversations like this are the best ways. Um, because when you're reading an article or when you're write, you know, reading a kind of news piece, you have to go and fact check everything. You can't ask questions. And things are presented in the way that the person writing or making the um, media wants, to, wants you to see them. And as someone who creates media, I know that's exactly what happens. I always find that there, there, there have been so many examples of people who have, like journalists and you know, independent researchers, who have come to Gamergate and said, thing, pe said to people, oh god, I've heard such terrible things about Gamergate. Why don't you tell me, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be brave and take a, you know, why don't you tell me about yourselves and, you know, I'm going to see if you're the evil misogynists that uh, I've heard that you are. And not one of them has walked away thinking that we're the evil misogynists that they've heard. Basically, they know they've been lied to. And I think a lot of people know they've been lied to. And I think, I think one of the real watershed moments was when Gamergate had contacted the Society of Professional Journalists, which is based in Miami. And... One of, the, uh, one of the professional journalists, uh, Koretsky, um, he had arranged for um, a panel, or two panels, in fact, on a day for you know, pro game get representatives, journalists, academics, and gamers to just go there and have their views interrogated by other professional journalists to see you know, what, was, what the deal was with the movement. And it was going really great. The whole day was going fantastic. And then someone called in a bomb threat to silence them. And wouldn't you know it, nobody would report on this bomb threat. Nobody would report on a bomb threat to the Society of Professional Journalists. So, yeah, it's a, it's a funny world we live in. Do you think future meetings to discuss the Game of Game movement, do you think that it seems like less of a possibility because of, for example, these fake bomb threats, etc.? It's hard to describe the people that Gamergate is dealing with without making them sound unrealistic. They're very much true believers in their ideology. And you might be thinking, what's an ideology got to do with it? And, well, honestly, I think that the ideology is the reason that they are so happy to find themselves on a private mailing list for journalists only. Because I, I can't imagine a... I mean, the Society of Professional Journalists were, of, of course, professional journalists. And so they have a code of ethics that they have to abide by. And we would tell them things that the gaming press would do, and they were just consistently horrified. You know, they would take money from developers, or they would pay money to developers, you know, the subjects of their writing. They would have personal relationships, and they'd have affairs, they'd be roommates. They would collude on private mailing lists between competing outlets, and time after time they were just like, no, these are the things you don't do. These are the bad things journalists should not do, because they compromise your impartiality and objectivity. And then we just showed them Twitter posts and even an article in Kotaku where they were just laughing at the idea of objectivity. They weren't they they just didn't think they should have objectivity. It for them it interrupted what they were doing, which was talking about video games that they wanted, not that what other people wanted really. But um I don't really know how to describe how their ideology is. I think really you have to you have to have some experience of it for yourself to really believe that these people would do these things. But these are the people who would then, when faced with a consumer revolt, instead of admitting their mistakes, they would run around to the mainstream media, and they have connections to the mainstream media. We have a leaked email from The Guardian, of all places, where two people are emailing each other, and one of them says to another, I can't remember the names of these people, unfortunately, they, they say, so what's the deal with this Gamergate uh, issue? And the person who sent the email... Uh, reply saying, don't worry about it. There, there's a lady called Leah Alexander coming down to tell us about it so we don't have to do any work. 
Now, Leia Alexander is one of the primary instigators who has caused Gamergate through her shoddy journalism and through her general lack of standards. Again, why why does this all come down to ideology? Well, it's it, they find it very. I I think, excuse me, I think they think that other people are kind of immoral, which again gets down to the right wing thing. I think they're using the term right wing as a pejorative because they think that people on the right are immoral rather than just wrong or something like that. And so it's actually a character judgment. And I think that they think that they're better than people. And I know that sounds crazy, but it's hard not to make it sound crazy because I think that it's the boldness of the lie that sells it. Because people think, well, there's no way you go around and say that a consumer revolt of people demanding ethics is actually a group of women-hating misogynists trying to force women out of video games. So it must be that that's the case because you, it's, su it's such a big lie you wouldn't make it up. You know, you, you would have to have some brass balls to make up a lie like that. And unfortunately, I think these people do have those brass balls. Let's talk about the positives of Gamergate. Uh, what has Gamergate actually accomplished over this past year? You've, of course, mentioned about uh, the improvement in ethical standards, yeah. etc. What, what else? What else has Gamergate accomplished? Right. Well, that, that's a great question, actually. Um, to start with, Gamergate has done a lot of charity work. And I know that sounds like a strange thing to do, but one, I guess I guess it's weird. I guess when you've got sort of 50,000 really well-meaning people who find themselves um, surprisingly well-connected on social media. And someone's like, you know what, there's, for example, there was um, a, a group called the Fine Young Capitalists, and they, would, they were doing a crowdfunding campaign. Uh, this wasn't actually a charity, this was just a crowdfunding campaign. But they were trying to get women into gaming. They were trying to get women developers into gaming. And their premise was, you give us the idea and we'll make the game and split the profits with you. And they needed, I can't remember how much it was exactly they needed, but they ended up raising around $70,000 because Gamergate threw their weight behind it. They were like, yes, this is what we want to see. And the Funyan capitalists had also been victimized by the press and people who were allies of the press. So I'm not going to lie, it may have been a little bit partisan that we were helping that, I, but um, you just couldn't stop people from wanting to donate. After hearing their story, I don't blame them, to be honest. And there's been, there's been loads. There's been anti-bullying charities. And uh, ironically, um, people have, uh, the, the people who are opposing Gamergate have called it weaponized charity. And I'm like, oh, wow, this, how terrible we weaponize charity. But, um, for example, you had a Gorka writer called Matt, uh, Sam Biddle, sorry. And he saw Gamergate happening and being part of the sort of um, ideological clique that uh, the game journalism is kind of part of. I mean, Kotaku is a major gaming outlet, and they're owned by Gorka, and they all work in the same office. So there's no doubt that the editor-in-chief of Kotaku could speak to Sam Biddle of Gorka, and so they're, they're obviously they're friends. You know, they're all on the same page. You're not going to get ideological diversity in organizations like this. And he decided to go to Twitter and go on a big Twitter rampage saying things like, um, what we need to do is bring back bullying. Uh, gamers and nerds need to be shamed into... Silence and stuff like this. And it's just like, wow, that's really surprising. So Gamergate raised uh, thousands of dollars for an anti-bullying charity to make a, a statement that we don't stand for that. We're not, we're not behind that sort of thing. In fact, we're the complete opposite. And, I mean, you had a fellow called Total Biscuit who is a YouTuber like myself, but he specializes in video games. And he's got around 2 million subscribers. And he will, he's, he's very much in favor of the objectives Gamergate has. But because of the climate he operates in with his fellow sort of critics and journalists, he, he can't really do all that much without copying a lot of flack. He wouldn't back down from the stance that the games industry needs reform, it needs ethical standards, and it needs to be made aware. It needs to be something that we talked about. And so they started sort of a hashtag campaign against him, and he's found himself, and he's a cancer survivor as well, so after he had cancer surgery, he's found himself very much on the, on the attack from these people. And I know it sounds like a nebulous thing, but one of the things I think that Gamergate has done is for people like him and for other developers and for other critics who have come out and said, look, I'm, I'm in favor of Gamergate as well. And there have been dozens now. We've given them refuge. We've given them a place where they can voice a dissenting opinion and find support rather than universal opposition. And I, I know that sounds weird, and I know that sounds extreme, but I, I really think that's one of the major things that Gamergate has done 
Because uh, one of the things about people in Genga is that the censorship was so extreme. I mean, places like Reddit would delete threads with 30,000, 40,000 comments in and just delete them because they were talking about this corruption. They, even on 4chan, the, the, the home, the bastion of free speech, conversation about Gamergate was censored. It blew my mind. Absolutely. How on earth? I mean, if you know anything about 4chan, then you'll know that <laughs> you'll know what goes there. And even Gamergate was banned from there. So uh, Gamergate was even banned from there. So it's, yeah, so it, it's provide, provided um, a sort of counterweight to the industry, which I think is very important. Also on the side, Gamergate supporters have even included their own little mascot for the movement, which I think in that, uh, personally, that's a bit of an accomplishment in itself. A small one, but nevertheless an accomplishment. Oh, what, Vivian James? Of course, yes. Uh, the uh, fiery orange-haired, not-so-happy-looking mascot with the <laughs> purple and green stripey uh, hoodie, yeah. I, I think cynical is the best, uh, the best way to describe it. But yeah, she's, she's seen some things. <laughs> she's um she's well you know she's seen the gaming press acting like petulant children because people are calling them out on the corruption and so uh, no it's it's an excellent mascot it was designed um it was designed on 4chan before gaming Gate was censored and yeah it, it became basically our mascot which is yeah of, of, of you know a gamer girl who is annoyed at the way that she's being treated you know carl thank you so much for coming to this interview my pleasure. Honestly, thank you. I, I probably rambled a bit too much, but honestly, my pleasure. I really appreciate it. Please, plug your YouTube channel. I'm sure there are many of my wonderful listeners out there who would, would love to check out uh, your talks about Gamergate, etc. on your YouTube channel. So go ahead, the floor's yours. Uh, yeah, my, my YouTube channel, you can find it by searching uh, for Sargon of Akkad, double K-A-D, on Google. Uh, it'd be the first result that comes up. And I have a playlist of Gamergate videos that's in chronological order. So if you want to see sort of uh, the way people, you know, the things we were talking about before Gamergate was really... Cause it kind of took a little bit of time for Gamergate to sort of click as an actual movement. Because before it was just people talking about a scandal. Um, and then it became a proper movement. Um, but yeah, I've got plenty of videos on there. And I've got uh, a liked list of plenty of other Gamergate videos that people can check out as well. And I would also like to thank my dear listeners out there for tuning in to The Cyber Den, your weekly dose of tech and games. See you later then, Carl. Thanks for coming. Thanks again.